Good morning. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm embarrassed to say that Adil actually uh, really dis revealed to me who Humboldt was. Uh, da Vinci I knew. I heard about Da Vinci, but Humboldt not so much. And I'm particularly embarrassed because after I started reading about him, I understood that I probably owe my academic career to this man. So, towards the end, I'll explain why I believe that Humboldt had an enormous role to play in what you'll be hearing about today. And if you've noticed on the left, he was a, an attractive man not just a scientist and a good scientist at that. I am going to talk about uh, the plant uh, era, the substances of the future. I hope that at the end of my uh, little uh, speech, you think that we will be uh, in the age of the plants and uh, of nature. Now, this is Alexander Humboldt. And I must begin my lecture with uh, the uh, previous uh, oil minister of the Saudi Arabia who said that the Stone Age didn't end for lack of stone on the earth <coughs> and oil will end long before the world runs out of oil and I think and I think that Humboldt would agree that that's one reason for that. There's one reason that biomaterials are just so much better, so much more improved uh, than uh, the synthetics that we create. But uh, in truth, that's not a good enough reason to come to us uh, with a critique to scientists to ask why didn't we make synthetic materials that are good enough? Because uh, the reason is that we didn't have enough time. 200 years of modern chemistry, maybe 300 years if we take in the Industrial Revolution, is not enough time to really develop good materials while nature, as uh, Humboldt saw, had billions of years for the processes of evolution to produce uh, materials and structures that we wish we could even approach their level. And uh, one of the things that are common to all of these materials uh, is that they're, of course, sustainable. Still, doctors, particularly orthopedic doctors, like to uh, glue and implant all sorts of synthetics into our body. And I don't think that this is such a good idea because synthetic materials fail. They fail just like your plastic uh, fork because they're not strong enough in order to do what they need to do. But the truth is that there are very powerful, strong synthetic materials. And still, why is it a bad idea to put them in our body? Well, the reason is because the biomechanical qualities are not always suitable to the tissues that surround them. And so they fail. But there's even a more basic reason why it's not such a great idea to screw and glue and implant all sorts of synthetics in our body. The reason is because in nature, things are done differently. In nature, every organism, whether it's a plant, insect, human, is made of cells. And cells contain DNA that uh, codes, uh, that is nanometrically coded uh, by with usually proteins, uh, sometimes enzymes that create other substances like uh, sugars. And uh, what's common to all of these is they don't need us. They know how to recognize each other and to create a scaffolding upon which cells organize, grow, create tissue, turn into organs, and then the organs create together an assembly that is the organism. And we in a Hebrew university in 17 years ago in my lab, we decided to focus on one of the most important building blocks of man, and that is collagen. It's a pro form of protein. Why is it the most important? Because we have the most of it. 
and uh, truthfully apart from water there's no nothing else that we have in the body more 30 percent of our dry weight is collagen i'll give you a couple of examples a bone creates is 50 percent collagen skin 70 percent tenons and f ligaments almost completely so anybody who's in the business of uh, body parts they should have collagen uh, but 17 years ago, when we just began our research, there were already then in the clinic over a thousand medical implants made of collagen. So I would assume that somebody would ask, then why did you t bother? I mean, if they existed over a thousand clinical usages already. Well, the reason that we embarked on this research is that with all of these devices like you see here on top here gels to you know fill your lips and this is for your meniscus and replace bone and they they existed but the source of them all was collagen from uh, cadavers either cow cadavers or human cadavers pigs and these are not safe uh, sources because they all are potential pathogen carriers bacteria, viruses, uh, mad cow, whatever you want. So the FDA in 2007 uh, came out with announcement to all researchers that they want to them to encourage them to create better options, better alternatives, and that's what we did. We used the five human genes that are responsible for producing collagen in their body, and through genetic engineering, put them into one tobacco plant. Now, plants don't know how to create collagen, as you know, but from the moment that we uh, put the genetic code that allowed the plant to create human collagen, now it knows how to do so through its leaves. This technology matured. Today in Israel, we have 25,000 square meters of nurseries from the northern Galilee in Israel to the, all the way to Haseva. Uh, farmers get from the company that sits in uh, the science park in Rehovot small tobacco plants. They look like normal tobacco plants, but they have five human uh, genes that have taught this plant to create human collagen in its plant, in its leaves. Farmers grow the tobacco plants 50 to 60 days, depending. Uh, the leaves are harvested. They have to be refrigerated and cooled and taken to Yesoda Ma'ala, and there the production uh, p uh, process begins. Now, if you've ever made pesto, then you know how to make collagen. It's a big food processor. You put in the grinder kind of a thing for the leaves. They're squeezed. The protein is extracted. And this distilled protein goes to the science park in Rehovot. And there, of course, in clean rooms, uh, uh, this goes through protein is uh, purified. And at the end is human collagen, which is completely identical to that in the human body. But it has no diseases because the plants are not carriers of human pathogens. And in addition, it is, of course, at a very high quality because it's not from old or used tissues. It's created in a factory, in a nursery, a plant nursery factory. And that's how we make medicinal plants that create human collagen and for. And there are various uh, uh, uses already. And uh, maybe I'll tell you about a couple. The first that was developed with this a collagen for an indicator called uh, uh, for a diabetic uh, ulcerated foot. I'm sure everybody knows about diabetes, but we're not sure about the scale. Over 400 million people in the world have diabetes. It's more than the entire number of people living in the USA. 20% of them will experience at least once in their lives a pressure ulcer, a diabetic ulcer, uh, that may lead to amputation of the toes or the entire foot. Now, this device that was developed allows us to heal the diabetic foot. And what we see here is after the first treatment by the physician, it's called debris, debrisment. Debrisment is taking off the dead 
tissues from the ulcerated sore and an injection of human collagen that was produced with plants. Now, something amazing happens. The live cells that live on the outskirts of the ulcer, they use the collagen as scaffolding, and so they bind through specialized receptors. They're called integrators, and they get a signal from this scaffolding that says, hey, guys, you're in the right place. Now start multiplying, and that's what the cells do. They multiply. They create a granulated uh, layer, and then they an additional layer called keratinocytes uh, starts to flourish and to close and to create a scab. Now, this is an image that I got from one of the doctors in Italy that works with this uh, 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 collagen. What you see on the left is the heel of a patient that for two years really didn't respond to any treatment. There's a real uh, uh, deep ulcer that is to the bone. We can see that it's abscessed and uh, it's about to be amputated. That is basically the fate of this foot at the moment, prior treatment. Post-treatment, we can see how the foot looks after three months of collagen. This person can, can go play soccer with Messi. Actually, Messi is not so the greatest anymore, although that Maccabi Haifa lost their game. But uh, that does that is enormously encouraging. And one of the developments that I was th thrilled about was something that we completed about a year and a half ago, in which we took that same human collagen and through a chemical uh, process that's called metacrination, we turned it into an ink that can be used in 3D printers at a high resolution. We work with an American company that has developed uh, ELP, a high resolution, my one almost one micron level uh, 3D printers that allows us to print really at a resolution that is uh, that creates uh, that uh, to simulate even a, a a very, a very delicate um, a blood a structures. This is a scaffold of a breast for a woman, a patient that had to go through a mastectomy uh, through breast cancer. And this process begins with the physician planning what they're going to do. There's a, set, a scan of the breast, exact measurements and configuration of what parts of the breast are going to be excised. <coughs> then when the configurations are provided, this be begins to print the scaffolding for the breast. Through that we take a life we do through liposuction take fat cells usually from the hips or other places where fat cells can be pr taken and with these fat cells we create endipose stem cells that are stem cells that are not exactly stem cells that already begin sorted into soft tissues but they still can create almost any cell that exists in the human breast including blood vessels, fat, and other cells that are necessary for the breast construction. And after the amputation, the mastectomy, this uh, scaffolding and the stem cells, so to speak, are introduced into the cavity. And within several weeks, the woman gets her own natural breast tissue. These are, we're still in the preclinical stage, but we have now concluded and I can show you results, interesting results that were in small animal uh, testing. We can see on the right here the uh, 3D uh, printed breast implant. And after seven days, we can see its implantation and its acceptance into the surrounding tissue. And then after 22 days, it's fully populated with cells. And we believe that at the end of the day, we will reach a point where we can uh, then send it to clinics around the world and it can be used everywhere. Now, seven years ago, I had a realization, it took a long time, but this realization was that plants are enormously effective producers of very complex proteins. And I was wondering what would be the next step that what we would like to create 
we would like to create antibodies in plants. Now, after COVID, now everybody knows, speaks immunology. I don't need to explain the basics of immunology, but we know that antibodies, they are our vanguard. They are those that charge ahead and fight pathogens and uh, cancerous growths. And they have, and there are all sorts of biological uh, drugs and medications that are based on antibody uh, processing uh, of uh, humanized antibodies, they're called. <coughs> and they're amazing. They've taken over the market, really. And one of the Umira one uh, drug, uh, uh, one Umira is, for example, is for autoimmune inflammatory conditions like Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, amazing drug. But there's only one problem with this drug. The cost of its use per patient per year is $35,000, so $100 a year plus minus, a lot of money. The result is that only one person of every thousand that could afford it, that use, that could afford Umira, can actually do it, that need Umira. So $100 a day is too expensive. And the question is, why are these drugs so expensive? And maybe somebody would say, because it's patented? No, no, Umira is no longer patented, and maybe you'd say there's no competition. No, there is competition. There are five companies in the world, Avvi, the American, and Angel, two big companies do the, that do produce Umira or a, a biosimilar option of Umira, and the price is still by, you know, uh, very, very pricey, and that's because of the way that we produce Umira, the kind of factory that has to be used to create these uh, uh, biomedicals. So we use bioreactors that are very expensive to run that create basically uh, uh, cells that are so delicate that have to be fed, factor, they have to be uh, uh, nourished and monitored, and that's a very expensive process. And the question is, if this factory is so expensive, why do it there? These are antibodies, and antibodies have genes, and that means that all we need to do is to extract these genes, the, informa the genetic information, and put it into a cheaper manufacturer. Plants manufacture things on the cheap. In a nursery, and you can raise them and grow them like lettuce and tomatoes, and that's exactly what we're doing. Today, we have established a company like BioBeta, and that's in the north of Israel, that has managed to to downsize by two scales the uh, price of processing and manufacturing of these antibodies, and we can create these medications not at a hundred dollars a day, but seventy cents a day, meaning in such a way. This is how the farmer works in India that makes, you know, $8 a day, but maybe has Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis that doesn't enable him to work. He can invest 70 cents a day. He doesn't need the government, doesn't need insurance, nothing. No HMO. There's a question being asked from the audience. We are not yet at the clinical testing phase. Uh, the first initial contract that we signed with was uh, with a Russian pharmaceutical company. And you know what happened with the Russians lately in the last few years? Yeah, that was prior to the war, exactly. So, okay, but uh, now there's a Swiss company that uh, we, are, uh, we are in negotiations with. And one of the good things that happened to us as a result of this delay with the clinical trials is we started also wondering what other uses potentially do engineered plants have that know how to create these complex proteins. And we came to the conclusion that there's one field particularly interesting, and that is cultured meat. And uh, there's a lot of uh, growth factors like insulin, FGF, and other that are involved in the uh, manufacturing of this kind of meat, substitute meat, and they're really expensive. And what you see here is a forecast of GFI. That's a company, or not a company, an organization that forecasts uh, this market growth. And their forecast for 2030, just less than a decade away, really, 10% of the meat that we will eat worldwide will be cultured meat. And one must understand that 10% is enormous. That's 280 million tons of meat, a market of $1.4 trillion. So we're talking about a huge 
uh, proportion, but there's a big challenge, and that is the growth factor cost. Because at the moment, if we quantify growth factor costs in order to create one kilogram of cultured meat, the cost is several hundred dollars per one kilo. Now, nobody's going to pay hundreds of dollars for one kilo of meat, obviously. But the problem is even worse than that, because if we observe the num the quantities of insulin required in order to make those 10% of the meat market, we would have to create 17,000 tons of insulin. It's impossible to even imagine 17 ton million tons of insulin within 10 years. So the world production of insulin at the moment worldwide is 200 tons worldwide. So. There's no way that even Lonza and Nura Nordis and other famous companies with that can, within a decade, uh, uh, multiply by a factor of 100 their insulin uh, production. The capex alone would be a nightmare. So, okay, we said that it's created with plants, and this is one example of FGF2, one of the required proteins that we are creating in plants and its activity, its chemistry, chemical activity is identical to the protein necessary for the process itself. Now, trees is the next topic. Adil told you earlier of, I think, 200 different plants or 300. Okay. I no doubt Humboldt uh, observed sequoias. I, even I observed sequoias. They are tall and uh, impressive and uh, carry hundreds, I mean, they are hundreds of years old and in very harsh uh, environment conditions, very low temperatures, uh, high temperatures, high UV uh, light. I don't know any plastic chair that will be able to meet that. <coughs> So I don't know, they're hardy, and if I look, for example, in a microscopic, in a electronic microscope into the tree, we can see that it's made of nanometric fibers that are about 100 to 200 nanometer length, about a diameter of five, seven nanometers. And I know, by the way, we all say nano, nano, but nobody knows how tiny a nano is. Let me just show you. <coughs> One tiny example, my hair is about 100 microns. If I take my hair and now cut it into 100 layers, and then take one of those layers and then cut it into 1,000 layers, that's a nanometer. So that is very, very, very tiny to the point where, of course, the human eye can't see. But the most surprising thing is that these nanometric, nanometric uh, uh, fibers, on the one hand, they're very strong, but they're also made of sugar. Okay, not really sugar that we drink in our tea, different kind of sugar, uh, cellulose, which is a polymer of glucose, uh, uh, a grape sugar, what's called, uh, but it's a, not a simple molecule, rather a crystallized form of polymer that is structured in a very organized way, and because it's very clear structure, its mechanical abilities are wondrous, meaning per weight, they are 10 times stronger than steel. Uh, but it's sugar. It's basically sugar, cellulose, something that breaks up and even maybe sweet, breaks up in the soil, is sweet. I mean, sugar. And analysts worldwide in the last, say, dozen years have claimed that this is CNC or cellulose nanocrystals or NCC, but nanocellulose, we call it, okay, is going to be one of the most important materials in industry. And it doesn't matter if we're talking, you know, uh, auto or mechanical industry, space industry, it doesn't matter, construction, food, anything, almost anything that has substance in it, materials in it by 2020 something, meaning the, the next decade it'll have some kind of nanocellulose because of the amazing qualities of this material. But there's one problem. If 12 years ago, let's say, you wanted to buy half a ton of nanocellulose because you wanted to make a plane or a boat, you could have Googled it on eBay or whatever, I don't know, you would never find it. 
you uh, would have found a thousand articles of researchers like myself and others around the world that would say it's an amazing substance, but you would never be able to find it commercially. Everybody in their lab had a hundred hundred grams of it, and that was about it. And we, within a consortium of uh, the free market, the European free market, uh, and Israel, the uh, Hebrew University, also another group from Finland, from Sweden, England, and Germany, uh, we established a consortium aimed at developing technology that would allow us to create this substance in large quantities at a reasonable cost and to start developing applications for it. And the first thing that we wanted to do was find, of course, and source a raw material. Well, sequoia trees, that's pretty difficult, and you really don't need sequoia trees because cellulose has, I mean, that's in every plant. It's very common in nature, in fact. And we even found one very good source for it, and that is the uh, recycled uh, paper uh, waste. Why? Apart from that, the fact that recycled paper waste has a lot of cellulose, it covers the globe. Europe itself creates now 11 million tons of this waste of uh, paper recycling manufacturing processes. That's about f four kilometers of uh, soccer field. Euro people, Europeans alone create a mountain and Americans create another mountain, and Chinese probably make two mountains of this stuff, and it's a real, you know, environmental problem for them. But for us, this is excellent raw material. So technology has matured, Pat patents have been written uh, on behalf of the Hebrew University and our Swedish uh, partners. A company was established, Elodea it's called, that now creates large quantities of nanocellulose. And now we, in Ramat Chovav, we have a factory that uh, does so. Now that we have the nanocellulose, what do we do with it? Well, look what nature has created, a wonder. If I take this substance now and put it, let's say, in water at a concentration of maybe two and a half, three percent, a bit more, miraculously, it creates liquid crystals. This is for several reasons that I'm not sure I have time to extrapolate on. Let me just mention one, but there's a negative charge that is created at high densities in this kind of nanofibers, and it's at it's a high aspect level. And when you force them to come closer, to come into proximity, they create these liquid crystals. And when then when you use these liquid crystals and you smear them on, I don't know, concrete, plastic, any su surface, the moment that the water evaporates, it does what every nanomaterial does. It does a self-assembly process into and becomes a clear, powerful film. How strong is this film? About two times stronger than epoxy glue. And by the way, there's no uh, covalent relations. These are all, and this is a natural substance that has hardened simply because it assembles, because its molecules are so, so beautifully and rigidly structured. Another quality it doesn't uh, transmit oxygen. That's great for the next application because many years ago, many years ago, this is how we packaged our food in boxes, cardboard boxes. It was a great, but in nano, uh, nano oxygen and uh, nano UV, the photo oxidation uh, process that would destroy any food was stopped. We managed to preserve food, great, but also heavy, expensive, and this developed flexible packaging, another industry in which we take polymer, like uh, low-density polyuretan, uh, uh, do a low lamination uh, uh, process to it, uh, and, uh, and add a couple of polymers to it, and we create soft packaging, also a huge market, over a trillion dollars for flexible packaging, but one problem. Once we took aluminum and did lamination on kind of a polymer substance, there's no way back, meaning if there's no way to go back. This builds a small island in you know New Jersey full of plastic, and we will have a continent of plastic. Maybe that will resolve our real estate problems. We'll be able to build a whole entire new continent made entirely of plastic wrappers and packaging. Maybe not a great idea, but a really big problem. And what we did was decided to develop it and expand it into making a packaging 
that would avoid this uh, recycling issue, this environmental pollution problem. And we managed to resolve of oxygen barrier, uh, meaning how can we stop the UV and oxygen filtering in? First of all, you have to seal in the product, right? And that means uh, there are several ways. Most companies, that's what they want. They want food to be sealed. They have a nice picture on the outside, and that shows you what's inside. While it's inside, it's sealed and safe. And that's what we did. We used nanometer particles either of magnesium of zinc oxide and as you can see on top we have the ability to create specific blocking of UV light and to leave all of the visible uh, areas uh, visible to the eye meaning uh, something that can be seen so we are creating packaging that are completely biodegradable, compostable, meaning it's completely regular paper in which you're printed the brand name and the companies are happy, but and they look exactly like regular packages, but they are uh, uh, decomposable. And this is going to be a great revolution because we cannot continue the way that we have gone thus far. כלומר, ציפוי ממש ממש עדין ודק ושימו לב איך הוא משפר בצורה דרמטית את התכונות המכניות למעשה אם אני מודד את האינטגרל מתחת לגרף שזה מה שאנחנו קוראים ה-toughness או ה-energy to break זה ערך שהוא בערך ב-500% יותר מהביקורת המשמעות היא שעכשיו אני יכול לייצר חולצות באותו חוזק חמש מ... חומר שמספיק בדרך כלל לחולצה אחת או לחילופין לייצר את החולצה לסופרמן. תכונה נוספת מעניינת של נאנו צלולוז זה יכולת הדיספרסיה שלו של חומרים שמאוד מאוד קשה להרחיף אותם, לעשות להם דיספרסיה במים. כמו למשל שופרות פחמן נאנומטריות. למה בכלל אנחנו רוצים לעשות את זה? בגלל התכונות הפיזיקליות המאוד מעניינות למשל של סביבי פחמן נאנומטרים שחלקם הם מוליכים ללחיצה, חלקם הם מוליכים ממש ממש טובים ומה שאתם רואים כאן זה פילם שייצרנו אם אנחנו משתמשים בהרבה כמובן הוא אטום לחלוטין אבל אם משתמשים בריכוז יחסית נמוך מקבלים עדיין פילם שניתן לראות דרכו וכמובן יש לו מוליכות חשמלית מאוד טובה וזה יש לזה הרבה מאוד שימושים בטאצ' סקרינס וכל מיני מקומות בתעשייה עוד תכונה מאוד מעניינת של נאנו צלולוז זה העובדה שהוא אחד החומרים הטיקסוטרופיים הכי טובים שיש על, בכלל על פני כדור הארץ. מה זה חומר טיקסוטרופי? כל אחד מאיתנו פעם הולך לסופר וקונה, אה, אני יודע, רוטב שום של אה, אוסם או משהו כזה. אנחנו לוקחים את הבקבוק, מנסים לשפוך את הרוטב וכלום לא יוצא. מה אנחנו עושים? אנחנו משקשקים אותו, מכניסים אנרגיה קינטית. השיר פורס שנוצר מוריד את הצמיגות בצורה דרמטית. כשאני אומר דרמטית זה אומר סדרי גודל. ברגע שאנחנו עכשיו לוקחים את הרוטב ושופכים אותו על הסנדוויץ', ברגע שהוא מגיע לפסטרמה קורה דבר נפלא, הוא לא ממשיך לזלוג לשולחן או לצלחת, הוא נעצר, עוד פעם הצמיגות עולה, זה בגלל שהפסקנו להכניס אנרגיה לתוך המערכת. התכונה הזאת מאפשרת לנו, כמו שאתם רואים כאן, להדפיס בתלת מימד מים בטמפרטורת החדר. טוב, זה לא בדיוק מים, זה מים עם שניים וחצי אחוז של נאנו צלולוז, אבל זה די קרוב למים. והסיבה היא, זה כאשר החומר נמצא במזרק, יש לו צמיגות, סדר גודל של מעל מאה אלף סנטיגרס, משהו כמעט כמו דבש. אבל ברגע שאנחנו לוחצים אותו, מפעילים אנרגיה, הוא עובר דרך המחט הדקיקה הזאת, 
מיד כמובן הצמיגות יורדת בחמישה סדרי גודל, ואז הוא ממש כמעט כמו מים, וברגע שהוא פוגש את המגש, הופ, הצמיגות עולה שוב. אז כאן לקחנו למעשה תמונה, שהפכנו את זה לפייל של סטייל של... זה באטר סקוטש קנדי כזה, לא זוכר איך קוראים לזה בעברית, יש לזה שם, כולם מכירים את זה, זה הסוכריה הזאת, חמאה, סוכרת חמאה, אבל זה בעצם מים. הדבר היפה הוא זה שאם אנחנו לוקחים ועושים תהליך שנקרא פריז דריינג, כלומר מקפיאים ומרחיקים בסובלימציה את המים, זה עושה סלף אסמבלי לספוג מאוד מאוד קל ו... נחמד, שיש לו הרבה מאוד שימושים מעניינים. תכונה נוספת של ננו צלולוז זה היכולת לשמש כטמפלייט לקריסטליזציה של פולימרים טרמופלסטיים. פה לקחנו פולימר שנקרא PVOH, הוספנו לו כמות מאוד קטנה של ננו צלולוז, ולאחר שהרחקנו את המים קיבלנו תרמ... ממש חומר מדהים שאחד הדברים המעניינים בו בצד ימין אתם לראות רואים מופיעים קריסטלים מאוד מאוד גדולים עכשיו הקריסטלים האלה הם מסדר גודל של ממש מאות מיקרונים זה לא ננו צלולוז למעשה הננו צלולוז שימש כטמפלייט שגרם לקומפוזיט שמכיל סיבים מאותו חומר והדבר המדהים בסיפור הזה זה התכונות המכניות של החומר הזה אני לא אלאה אתכם בכל החישובים אבל בצד ימין אפשר לראות קבלר למשל, הטפנס שלו, כמות האנרגיה שאני צריך לקרוע קבלר היא סדר גודל של 50 מגה ג'אול לקיוביק מיטר, שזה קבלר הוא חומר מאוד חזק. הדרג ליינס של הספיידר סילק, זאת אומרת החוט של כור העכבי שכולנו יודעים שזה הסיב הכי חזק שיש בטבע סדר גודל של 150 כלומר פי שלוש יותר מקבלר הקומפוזייט החדש שייצרנו כ-200 זאת אומרת באמת מדובר פה בחומר מאוד 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 חזק עוד שימוש מאוד מעניין זה ל-flexible light emitting films כולנו מכירים היום את ה-LED lighting, LED lighting זה דבר מאוד מאוד חשוב, חוסך לנו הרבה מאוד אנרגיה, רק יש בעיה אחת, האור של ה-LED light, ה-LED הכחול, הוא לא כל כך נעים לעין, כי אין לו את כל הספקטרום הלבן, ולכן זה אור קצת מעצבן. כדי להתגבר על הבעיה הזאת, מה שעושים זה עושים ציפוי של נורות ה-LED הכחול, עם חומרים פוספוריים שפולטים אור בעקבות הקרינה של האור הכחול, עושים הסחה לאדום לכיוון של ירוק ואדום. ואז ביחד מקבלים בעצם את ה-RGB או מקבלים בעצם את הצבע הלבן. הבעיה היא שהחומרים האלה מכילים חומרים שנקראים מתכות נדירות. ויש פה גם בעיה גיאופוליטית וגם בעיה אמיתית. אחד, חלקם הם חומרים רעילים, והדבר הנוסף, סין היום מחזיקה ברוב המחוות האלה, אז יש בעיה גיאופוליטית. כולם היו רוצים לעשות את זה עם חומרים פוספוריים אורגניים פשוטים שאנחנו אפילו משתמשים בהם לצרכים שלנו במזון. הבעיה היא שברגע שמאירים חומר כזה אורגני עם אור עם עוצמה כל כך חזקה, הוא עובר תהליך של פוטו בליצ'ינג בתוך דקות. וזו כמובן בעיה. ומה שעשינו בעצם, לקחנו את החומרים האורגניים האלה, הוספנו אותם לתוך חלבון מאוד מעניין שנקרא מיוצין, שמה שמיוחד בו זה שיש לו כיסים הידרופוביים וכיסים הידרופילים. באופן כזה בעצם הצלחנו למקם במרחב חומר ירוק הידרופילי וחומר אדום הידרופובי. כל זה הוספנו את הננו צלולוז וזה עשה סלף אסמבלי לפילם מאוד מאוד יפה שכמו שאתם רואים גם כשאנחנו מצפים לד מקבלים אור לבן מאוד מאוד יפה אתם רואים במרכז זה ללא הציפוי בצד ימין זה עם הציפוי פה למטה גם עשינו כל מיני עינויים לחומר 
בטמפרטורות גבוהות, לזמן רע ולחויות, זה מתפקד מאוד מאוד יפה. להראות לכם... Now to show you how much, how nature is amazing and how these materials are amazing as well, nanocellulose also have a, a other a, a piezoelectric qualities, meaning you get an electrical current, it has enormous applications from using it in sensors, nanogenerators, and today there's even engines that are based on uh, piezoelectric uh, uh, materials. But here we have a substance that is basically in nature, sugar. And what we can do is build amazing devices with it. That's something that we develop and work a lot on. Nanocellulose is also a hydrophobic, uh, it has a hydrophilic, uh, sorry, uh, substance. But we also need hydrophobic uh, appliances. So through this development, we cre created hydrophobic, not hydrophobic uh, water. It, uh, is, it goes against water. We can see these little droplets that are turning into balls, droplets meaning this is created. We created from this something that's, that's called a gel foam or aero foam a kind of a sponge-like material, which is very light. And uh, here, you, I mean, it's even, it, it's, it's sitting uh, on a flower. And this very, very light material it can absorb hydrophobic, uh, like chloroform and uh, oils and certain things. It can absorb things at an enormous capacity, 200 grams of chloroform for one gram of the substance. So here on the right, for example, an oil spill, we put a tiny amount of this uh, foam and it absorbed all of it. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about that Humboldt also talked about insects. So let's talk about the flea, this cute little thing I've been working with in the last 12 years because it is an Olympic jumper, this little flea, the best jumper in the world. It's a phenomenon, a flea can jump 100 to 150 times its height. Imagine a human sitting in the middle of Manhattan and with one jump getting to the Empire State Building. So everybody would like to be able to jump like a flea, but I mean the question is how does the flea do it? Well, through evolution it has developed this amazing protein called Rizalin. And Rizalin, this protein in fleas, is like rubber, amazing, the most wondrous rubber in the world. It can be stretched as much as you humanly imaginable, and it doesn't lose ener energy even through friction. And the moment that you let it go, puff, suddenly it comes back like a rubber band and with you produces enormous momentum. And this is how the flea jumps these enormous distances, and it creates this protein in its body and accumulates energy through a jumping pad and when it needs to release it it jumps out and releases the energy now you can imagine that millions of years ago this flea existed and he wasn't so great at jumping and but this flea doesn't exist anymore the fleas that we have today have uh, you know managed to jump over every empire state building so to speak and now there's this they have this amazing protein that we would like to have how do we create this protein ourselves one option is to get a lot of fleas and extract it no not such a great idea maybe and uh, you wouldn't create a lot of substance through in individualized fleas. But that's what's great about technology and science. You just need the DNA, and you need to clone the DNA that creates that protein and put that into something less jumpy than a flea, like a plant that doesn't jump anywhere. And then you can create a lot of resin. And now I didn't tell you everything because I didn't have a lot of time, obviously, but the flea creates resin, and resin has another site called a kite binding domain, a kiting binding domain. And this new element is a composite of nanometric of, uh, fibers of different sugars and the cellulose of insects, let's call it, very broadly, and this elastic area of the resonant. And as you know, we prefer, prefer nanocellulose, then we simply replace the chitin binding domain with a cellulose binding domain. And we hope that we'll be able to replicate this nanocomposite that includes cellulose and resilin, like a flea. And what you see is a short clip 
demonstrating what happens when you bind these two materials together. On the right, a nanocellulose foam in water, I'm pressing it, and you can see that it acts like a plastic material, it doesn't jump up. And the next has resonin. Look how different it reacts. Amazing, you can do this many, many times. People always smile when they see this, I think, because it reminds us of childhood, you know, like, uh, it reminds us of a jack-in-a-box, something that constantly comes back up. But they don't smile in India. Apparently, they don't have a jack-in-a-box in India. So if you want to make a lot of money, you can probably sell Humpty Dumpty's and jack-in-the-boxes in India because apparently they don't have that culturally. But one of the applications for this today is we're working with a company, a Swiss company, and we want to create sports shoes for optimal uh, performance, but obviously it has many other applications. You remember the collagen I talked about initially, and we, we asked ourselves what would happen if we take s fibers of collagen and add a tiny amount of resilin. Will this improve its mechanical qualities? And this is with the goal, of course, of creating tendons and ligaments in the future. And you can see on the left the blue line is regular collagen. And then with added at a 5% collagen, look at the performance, uh, uh, look at the level of toughness, 300% better in uh, breaking point levels, meaning the point of this that once we have tendons and ligaments that are artificially manufactured, patients after surgery will have better performance in their new limbs than they had prior. So what do we look to in the future? I believe that we'll be able to create everything through plant-based uh, production in the future. And that would mean that these things would be cleaned and distilled and purified and stored and we would use modern uh, technologies like 3D printing to create amazing things, even hearts. Now, a human heart is probably very complicated, but the heart that we would create would be better than one that we get from a donor because it will be made from newer substances, better sources. Now, that's still ahead of us, and there's a lot of work yet to be done. It's a lot uh, more difficult than creating a breast implant for cancer survivors, but I believe that as technology advances, we'll be able to get there as well. So I think I've convinced you, first of all, that I owe great thanks to Mr. Humboldt because he was the man who opened my eyes without even knowing. And the reason for that is a new, another quote from there, another wise person, Pavlov. We, know all, we all know Pavlov. And the quote is, if you want a new idea, open a new book, an old book, sorry. And I say that this old book has been written, was written a million of years of evolution, and the text is the DNA of life in nature. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, and all we need to do is exactly what Humboldt did, read that text and start uh, our progress from there. Oh, and one thing to say to you, you see this image, this image, the, per the woman who j painted it is very talented, uh, she's your graduate, and it happens to be that she's also my youngest son's girlfriend, or friend, uh, briefly. Just briefly, one, 
A large park in California based on sequoia trees is named the Humboldt State Park. But most importantly, look, uh, Oded and I have known each other for many years. When we just got to know each other, initially, we, I think we met maybe once every six months, maybe, and I sort of noted to myself that once every six months, he says new things to me. And then uh, we became better friends, and we met more frequently, you know, not every six months, but actually several times a week. And then I wrote to myself, Oded uh, says something new to me every single day. Now he did it again. Humboldt wrote, I told you, almost 50 books, I think. And the last that he wrote, uh, because he actually, he died uh, towards the end of writing the book, and it was called The Cosmos. And towards the end of his years, uh, his life, that he had an overall view of the universe. And he wrote the book Cosmos, uh, talking about space and uh, 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 through Earth and uh, the Earth's crust and uh, volcanoes and then drilled down into the center of the Earth and then, of course, talked about his entire vast knowledge uh, overall and summarized it. Now, we decided to give our speakers today the first two uh, uh, volumes of Cosmos. Uh, there are five. And uh, then at the time, before they were uh, uh, booked uh, uh, stores, every one of these books cost uh, very, very dearly. But these first two volumes became bestsellers nevertheless, and every publisher around the world was calling Germany to print more and more of Humboldt's Cosmos. So, and what it says here, I'm going to read this. Professor Oded uh, Chassil, uh, I thank you very much for your contribution to this conference, for including us on your vast and broad-ranging knowledge and your great contribution to us. And I provide you this humble token of the first two volumes of Cosmos by Alexander Humboldt, please take this as a token of our appreciation uh, on behalf of myself and uh, the uh, Fulon Technology Institute. We thank you.